Well, brethren, it's been nearly 11 months since I last preached on uh, John the Baptist. In our study of Luke 1, we've seen that there are what I call connected segments in the 80 verses. There's so much going on. To see how they're related, we could use the analogy of a jigsaw. As adults, we've all watched young children, I'm sure, uh, as they try to interlock different shapes. And I suppose we've all encouraged them to do one thing, and I was asking the twins, and you know which twins I mean, I was asking the twins this week, what's the one thing to do? And they said, find the four corners, then find the edges, which gives you, of course, the framework in which to work. The remaining pieces then will fall into place sometime or another. And we might see the glee of a child when two pieces or three pieces click together. But then they realize actually those three pieces have got nowhere to go yet because they don't fit with anything else. They're just part of the whole. They're a small part of the whole and they've got to be joined together to others for the complete picture. And I can give you four verses that fit together perfectly. And when his time of service was ended, he, Zechariah, went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. And then this verse. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth. And she bore a son. Now, the first three verses are at the beginning. There is then a gap of 30 verses before you come to that final verse, and yet it all fits together. And so we probably have to ask the question, well, why did Luke work like this? Just as a child, when they are trying to fit those things together, they do not see the whole. Well, Luke interrupts the nar narrative of John the Baptist, his future son, to give us further information. And without that information, we cannot build the full picture. And of course, I'm referring to the allusions then to Mary, Gabriel speaking to Mary, Mary going to see Elizabeth and speaking with her, and then we return to the birth of John the Baptist. Luke knows that there's more to it than just Zechariah and Elizabeth. For Zechariah has been told something. Whether he believed it at the time or not doesn't matter. You're going to have a child. You're going to have a son. And you're going to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So behind the birth of his own son, there was something ev even more majestic. And the birth to an elderly couple was wondrous. But in this, there's a hint of something profound. We could say that God had been silent for 450 years. Malachi had been written. Nothing else came until this time. And of course, Malachi referred to Elijah, the same Elijah who was linked to the priest's expected child, the one to come in the spirit and power of Elijah, who would turn the hearts of fathers to children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord that people prepared. And we've got to be careful here because God's word was always available to his people. In that sense, he always spoke to them. Every time they came together, God's word was before them. But no new revelation was forthcoming until this time, and it is so important. We can set forth 
what happens in this chapter through several characters. Gabriel, the angel, and then Zechariah, Elizabeth, and Mary. And they're all interlocking, playing their part in developing this wondrous story. And so we're now ready to hear of the birth of this first child of the two, a son to Zechariah and Elizabeth. But before we come to the birth event, notice that we still don't really understand what the framework is that Luke is dealing with. We're hearing about this, we're hearing about that, but we haven't yet got the framework of reference that binds together everything. Because you have one woman advanced in years in the hill country, town of Judea, and the other, a young virgin living in a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And Nazareth did not have a brilliant reputation. Of course, the birth of their second child would be in the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. The birth of the son to Elizabeth and Zechariah is linked back, as I said, to what Zechariah had been told by Gabriel. And so the time has come for the birth of this child, and she bore a son. Not a girl, she bore a son. The prophecy gets a big tick, because it's true. It certifies a vital element of the prophecy. This was a momentous event in the region of the hill country, though Luke speaks of it in just a plain way. But remember, a prophecy made from on high and through Gabriel who declared that he had stu he stood when he wasn't down on earth in the presence of God in his throne room and he'd been sent to speak to them or to Zechariah to bring about this good news. This had now come to pass. Prophecy was on the march. The God of the Old Testament, in statements and promises that always came to pass, is now, for the first time in the New Testament, making like promises and bringing them to fruition. Old and New Testaments speak of one God and Father, but now by the Holy Spirit's indwelling work, many will come to know the rich, precious, and long-standing promises from the Old Testament that had to be fulfilled in the seed of the woman. And it comes through God's promised word, above all to Abraham, the other patriarchs, and David, and among the prophets, principally by Isaiah. The child of aged parents will go before and prepare for the time of another son, Emmanuel, God with us. There are five steps in 57 to 66. A birth, a response to it, circumcision on the eighth day, the naming of a son, and then a response to that event. Represented in the ten verses, then, we have Gabriel's words fulfilled, Zechariah's obedience to the angel's words after nine, ten months, and Elizabeth's trust in what a husband had managed to communicate to her during that time, because, remember, he was deaf and dumb. But they communicated there's no doubt about that. To begin with, we note Zechariah is not sent a stage. You'll hardly hear about him here. It's as if he's just been pushed aside. I mean, what can he do? He can't speak. He can't hear what's been said. He's not sent a stage. Family and friends relate to Elizabeth. She is in the limelight, but she is aware the Zechariah has a promised time to come. 
when his lips, his mouth will be released once again. Physical bondage will end. An unexpected birth then of a covenant child to an elderly couple shows how God's people should respond when he favours his people. Her neighbours and relatives had heard about what the Lord had done, how he'd shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. It was a corporate rejoicing. The worshipping community unites to express its delight and wonder to Elizabeth at what the Lord has done. They recognize God's activity in manifesting his mercy. The word in Greek for rejoiced is the same as the one that Mary had used in verse 46. My soul magnifies the Lord. And that is what we should do in prayer. Whatever we magnify the Lord, we rejoice in him. And this rejoicing is heavenward. It's to the God of heaven for what he's done. But with a sense of brethren, as one committed by what has taken place. I could slightly rephrase a favorite incarnation hymn to show this little bit. O come ye to Judea's hill country and wonder at God's loving kindness to man. It is deeply amazing that he in his mercy the covenant eternal did plan. And I, we can't put that in, of course, because it, the, the hymn is about our Lord Jesus Christ. But this one was the forerunner. And we can be as assured of his work as that of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were rejoicing. Gabriel has said they would rejoice. You'll have joy and gladness. Many will rejoice at his birth. He will be great before the Lord. Well, we don't know about that. That has to be shown later on, of course, in John's life. But if the other promises are there, you can be assured that this promise would take place as well. But of course, the half had not yet come to pass. For we will see God breaking into the thinking of these people as they come to terms with all that's happening in this event. To in, in terms of their faith and their belief in his word and the, the need for them to take this situation extremely seriously and to disciple under it. Now, full significance of the child's role is not known to the family and to the neighbors, but God's hand is apparent. They might, and I'm sure they did, over the months, speak of the wonder of the birth of a child to Abram and Sarah and say, well, this is the same. That was a mighty event which had a real outcome. We will see. They might see echoes, yes, of Genesis then with Abram and Sarah. And they might remember that she said in her latter days, he'd look down upon her taken away her reproach among people. So here the individual, what is happening to Elizabeth, to her husband, intertwines with the community up in the hill country of Judea. As the child will indeed be a prophet of the coming of the Lord. Well, a few days later, they joyfully return, obediently, to perform the covenant sign of circumcision. Set down by God with Abram in Genesis 17 and formalized in the Mosaic law in Leviticus 12. And for Zechariah and Elizabeth, their obedience to Gabriel's words about the child's name will now come to pass. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. So they, that right, that sacrament was had taken place but the family thought well there's something else let's give him a name and of course it would be after his father Zechariah again what Luke is doing is underscoring that God is bringing redemption to Israel 
from within Israel, as he promised. The link to Abraham is manifest, and I know some say unquestionable. The child receives the covenant sign made with, by God with Abraham. The child's entrance into the covenant community. Now, a firstborn son, it is true, often received his father's name or his grandfather's. This is what those around the boy naturally thought would happen. Naming a child at circumcision, however, was not necessarily something which was general practice. I suspect that here it's to do with Zechariah's situation. He cannot really enter in physically to the sacrament because of his deafness and dumbness. Usually circumcision was performed by the head of the house. Well, whatever that be, there is a real and an emphatic surprise to come to those neighbors and relatives. They want to see the child's name. But Elizabeth says, no, he shall be called John. Now, sometimes when you read commentators, you despair. Because some people feel that she knew her son's name because of a specific revelation that she'd been given during her pregnancy, which is not reported in Scripture. Not reported? These commentators go off a tangent sometimes. Zechariah was deaf and dumb. It did not stop communication between husband and wife over such a vital issue. And one writer said he would have spoken to Elizabeth a hundred times over about it, over those nine months. And the name, of course, was full of significance. John, Yahweh, has shown favor. But of course, those around do not know what Elizabeth knows. The no used is forceful. She's absolutely at one with her husband. We know it in many other contexts in the New Testament from the Apostle Paul. Not at all, by no means. Having grasped what a husband could tell her about their expected son and his given name, let alone something of his future function, she will repel any suggestions of a name from family and friends. After all, her husband has been spoken to by one who stood in the throne room of God, Gabriel. And don't be put off by Elizabeth giving the name. Because Zechariah's tongue was not released, he couldn't do it. We know if we look carefully at the Old Testament, that naming a child in the Old Testament was more often than not done by the mother than the father. The family, not having known of the angel's message and the many awkward communications of husband and wife, react as we might expect. They said to her, but none of your relatives is called by this name. They were shocked. They couldn't quite understand this. Perplexed? Yes, they were. And they can only think of one way out of what seems a strange situ a strange situation. They must appeal to poor old Zechariah. Yes, in their eyes, though he and his wife had been blessed with a son, he's not been able to engage, at least in public, with a true sense of joy. And what they are doing is to appeal to him, suggest that they saw him almost as an outcast in society at that time, unable to function as priest, difficult to engage in communication. So they make signs to him, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And they, I think, were quite certain that he would say, Zechariah. One can imagine some of the gestures and the shrugs that they were making to try to seek an answer. And then we told that Zechariah asked. Now, that's not asked with his mouth, but signaled, signed for something to write down, which he would have, been, which he would have done 
frequently with Elizabeth, asks for a writing tablet, and he writes, his name is John. At least, that's what the English says. The Greek is far plainer, far more emphatic. John is his name. In fact, I think some would say John, his name, leaving it, even leaving out the verb. No argument can be brooked now. Both parents are of one mind. And verse 63 ends with a comment about the onlookers. They all wondered. So not only have they been granted the birth of a child and the time of circumcision, but they've been granted a child with a name which is unexpected. And perhaps with puzzlement comes a new thought to them that something more than a very special birth has taken place. For Zechariah would not have been expected to react in that way of saying, yes, his name is John. They sense the Lord's hand behind what they're witnessing. And he does not keep them in suspense. But he adds to their wonder in a way that would shake them to the core. We hear Zechariah's voice again. A new, powerful voice declaring God's goodness to men through the coming life and work of John and another figure. Zechariah praises and gives thanks in a remarkable way. Verse 64 opens, and immediately. The next words were a thunder roll to climax the drama. His mouth was opened, tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. Four weeks ago, we sang a hymn, I think, to the American tune. All for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. And I was reminded then through verse 6, somewhat of Zechariah. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise, ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. And that is, in fact, what was happening there. That had been taking place. Great rejoicing. Great rejoicing. I don't know what am I... Oh, it's not lost. Ye blind, behold, your Saviour come, and leap, ye lame, for joy. There was a sense in which this man had been blind, not physically, but in his understanding of God's promises. But he'd worked them out by God's grace. And I'm sure... He did feel lame, stuck in a corner maybe, not doing very much, but now he can leap for joy. So Zechariah's mouth has been opened by the Lord. Not that his son's birth, which is a confirmation of Gabriel's words, but at the very moment when he himself confirms his faith in God's promises. Those nine or ten months have gone by. Now, he knows that the promises are true. And it comes with the name of his son, John. This is the beginning, in, in this small verse, it's the beginning of the latter part of the chapter, which is known as Zechariah's Benedictus, Zechariah's blessing. And it really, it seems to begin, blessed be the Lord God of Israel in verse 68. But Luke probably wanted to keep wonder at John's birth going in the reaction of those assembled. And then we hear those words, and immediately. We're, we're quite used to the uh, words immediately. But it's used in Luke Acts in this particular way to indicate the presence and effect of divine power. So, those assembled do not know Gabriel's words, but we do, and we see their fulfillment. Yes, he would be silent, he would be unable to speak, he was told, until the day these things take place. You did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Now, the, the word immediately we know, we've heard it many times here, from Luke's gospel, from Mark's gospel, gives a sense of 
this something there, and then something, and then something. Almost a sense of urgency in Mark's short gospel of the three years ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. Baptism followed by temptation. He comes and he says the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And then twice closely linked, he uses the word immediately to call some of the fishermen disciples. And then he's in Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue teaching as one who had authority, not as the scribes. And immediately in the synagogue, man with an unclean spirit cried out. Jesus rebuked him to be, si be silent, come out of him. And at once, immediately, his fame spread throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately, he left the synagogue. Now, <coughs> in Luke, the English word has a much deeper meaning in the Greek. Literally, immediately after something or next to. For Luke, the something is the presence of Almighty God in what has occurred. Theologians use this adjective which we don't hear very often. Numinous, numinous, which means awe-inspiring in response to God's work. And that is what is taking place here. And I would think that probably within two months when we come, some of us, to be reading Luke's Gospel, we need to be looking out for that word immediately and to be able to interpret it properly. Part of the Greek is para, which is alongside the paraclete, the one who comes alongside. But here it is, one who comes alongside the matter that's been represented. And as a consequence of, of what the Lord God, the triune God has enacted, I'll give you three examples. And you, you, you'll see the context quickly in Luke and in Acts. Immediately rose up before them, picked up what he'd been lying on, went home, glorifying God. Amazement seized them all. They glorified God, filled with awe, saying, we've seen extraordinary things today. So a man has been raised up off his pallet. His friends have come to, come to help him. And it, there is an immediate reaction to the wonder of this. That's that word immediately. There's another small one. He laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. So in relation to this, that happens. Praise of God. And then there's one in um, the beginning of Acts and I, the first verse I, I, I tend not to, not to say in the ESV not in the RSV, I'll say it in the AV. That shows you how long ago I learned this verse. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Then a full stop. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And our Lord takes him by the right hand, raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. He leapt up, he began to walk, he entered the temple with them, and he walked and leapt and he praised God, all in relation to divine work. So consequent to God's actions, there is an outcome, outpouring of joy. And so it was with Zechariah, an unexpected birth, a father regaining his voice to praise the Lord. And the wonder of it gripped the whole assembly in these last words in the section. And it wasn't just this wonder now is really awe because it's fear came upon them and godly fear came on all their neighbors. These things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea and all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, what then will this child be? The corporate reaction of those assembles, assembled knew that fear of which we've spoken, that awe, numinous awe and wonder with reverent worship in the presence of divine activity. I think this is part of what our brother Bob must have been talking about. 
in coming into worship, the way we come to worship. It's not something that we decide. shouldn't be anyway. It's there in Scripture. It's the presence of divine activity. And it's no temporary response. For they spread these things, they spread, they spread the things abroad, the great events. And effectively, the word which is used of Mary, and I think can be used, must be used of Zechariah, they pondered them. They pondered them. The importance and reverence for God's people. What indeed would become of this child? Perhaps in time they'd reflect upon the names. God remembers Zechariah. God is faithful, Elizabeth. God is merciful, showing favor, John. And then, of course, later on, some of these who perhaps lived for 20 or 30 years would really have come to see that there was another name above all of these. Yeshua, Jesus, God saves. Luke is telling the story of salvation. And as the narrator, he adds the section, the last few words, for the hand of the Lord was with him. Because he wants all to consider that the faithful God shows mercy to sinners as he remembers his promises to save, set out regularly in the Old Testament. This is what we have here in this in these words. However, we've got to think of Zechariah. What was he doing for nine months? He'd been chastised, he'd been punished. He couldn't go back to a function as a priest. He'd failed to believe Gabriel's words. In other words, he'd, he'd failed to believe a promise that came from God. But God meant it for good to this man. And undoubtedly, by God's grace and the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit, Zechariah came to a deeper understanding of prophecy and God's promises in covenant. Imagine those months. Sat there with no one to speak to, just some communication with his wife. Looking at the Old Testament scriptures. Oh, for his coming son, that wasn't too difficult, was it? Elijah, Malachi, once he got hold of those, he could see about his own son. But he knew that there was something else behind. He had to go wider to understand about the son that Mary was to bring forth. I wouldn't be at all surprised that he actually knew the name of the child. Because Elizabeth would surely have communicated. Mary has said the son is Jesus. God saves. That would have only have excited him even more in his search for the truth. He searches God's word and he sees how blessed he, his wife, Mary, his wife and Mary and the nation are to be. And he's done something that I think we probably don't do enough of. And I say we and I look in the mirror. We don't ponder enough. Everything is like that today, isn't it? Snap, snap, snap. If I go on to Google, there's this thing, there's that thing. And I think, why am I looking at these things? They, they don't really improve my mind they don't give me much to think about so often other times of course we need them we need to be settled by something that we see but how often do we really sit and ponder sit and ponder this is what this man was doing and you see what happened to him and his response to it is the key to how he will praise the lord that praise is really an appendix to the whole story of the, of the birth of the one child and the promise of the birth to Mary. By the way, Joseph is only just mentioned just like that. He's virtually absent from everything. He comes in the second chapter. Its final position, this outpouring, this response, the final position 
after the birth makes it carry great theological weight and in doing so gives us a powerful framework with which to work. What he says has the character of prophecy. Though it begins as a psalm of praise, it moves into a spirit-inspired commentary on the significance of the events that have begun to take place. They've begun to take place. And when, God willing, on another occasion, and I'm trying to steal a, a Sunday off a Brother Adrian in a few months, we can look at the praise which arises from Zechariah. And that is a praise which is right out of the Old Testament, looking forward to God's promises that he'd placed before his people time and time again. This man then, I'm sure he believed God's word before what happened with Gabriel, or most of God's word, but he could just not apply it to himself. But here he is. He's seen the Old Testament for what it really is pointing forward to, and he's going to rejoice. And really, we should be doing exactly the same. 2,000 years later or not, we should be rejoicing with him that the Old Testament came to fruition in our Lord Jesus Christ. And indeed, if, if we could have a much bigger jigsaw, we'd have to put what our brother was saying in his panorama this morning about our Lord Jesus Christ, because that is a beginning of the fullness. So we can rejoice in this man's commitment, his loving wife's commitment, and of course, we will read about Mary on other occasions and we know how she pondered things in her heart. So grant us to be a, a pondering people who think deeply on what our Lord has done for us and who when we come to worship, to Bible study, to prayer, are always able to render thanks to our God for all the good gifts 